Hello and welcome to This Day with B.J. Arnett. And I'm B.J. Thank you so much for allowing me into your home today. Like every time I come into your home, I'm honored to be able to speak with you through this vehicle called television. I get to talk to a lot of great people and what really is special about it is that I get to learn a lot while I'm having these conversations. So join me as I welcome this lady who I've known for, gosh, I don't know, a good 10, 15 years, I think. Uh, Ruth P. Watson is an author, an educator, an all-around fantastic woman of, with great knowledge and great understanding of what God is doing in her life. But I want to talk a little bit about what she's doing right now as an author. Ruth, thank you for joining us. Thank you, BJ, for having me. It's funny, you know, we see each other out and about and then we'll talk over the phone and then when you told me about this book, I thought, okay, this, this sounds really interesting. I really wanted to know more about it, but let's pull back from the book for a moment to talk about Ruth. Oh, tell, okay. tell us a little bit about your journey and what brought you to being an author in the first place. You know, BJ, as a child, I used to write poetry. Mm -hmm. And I had one of these strict grandmothers that said that children needed to be quiet at Seen all times. Seen and not heard. Seen <laughs> and not heard. And when she was reading, you were, were supposed to be reading as well. So I would write poetry, do anything mm -hmm. to keep myself busy because I knew that there was a recourse if I did not do what she asked me to do. Absolutely. So I started writing poetry mm -hmm. as a child, ne not thinking ever that I would be a writer mm. or uh, on this journey that I'm on right now. I tried everything. When I went to college, people told me, said, you know, you should be a journalist. You should be this. It was everything but what I was in school for. Mm -hmm. So I think I've been writing my entire life and when there was something free in a magazine, my grandmother would make me write a letter to get it. I remember writing and getting this back teeth. <laughs> and you didn't know you stuff. were getting trained at that point no, in your writing. I didn't. I didn't know anything. I was just doing what she told me to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And it all turned out to be a career for me. Which is really awesome. This is not your first book. Uh, the, this book is A Right Worthy Woman. Mm -hmm. This isn't your first book, however. No, it's not. Talk to us about some of the books before. I've written a total of seven books. Mm -hmm. um, four published by a major publisher, and um, the rest I... Self-published. Self Self-published. I started writing historical fiction. I always wanted to write historical fiction, although I dipped and dabbed into young YA and children's novels. I just liked to write a, st a good story. And I wrote my first book, Blackberry Days of Summer, mm -hmm. which ended up being a musical uh, an award-nominated musical for a Susie Bass, and I was just so happy to to be in that space um, of uh, doing some things that I enjoyed as creative because I worked in corporate America for so long. And I always felt like I might be a square trying to get into a circle. <laughs> that, said that corporate life was not the life you were supposed to have? <laughs> no, it wasn't the life I was supposed but to have. But isn't it funny, don't you find it funny that, you know, the, the restriction that you thought of growing up, of your grandma seeing and not her children, and telling you when she reads, she, you have to read, that it really is the way you got to hear being an award-winning author. Because had she not put those restrictions on you, had she not given you those parameters, you might not have arrived at this place. No. Which is the God-given place where you were to arrive. So train up your children in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart. Hmm, there's some wisdom in that. She trained you up she did. to go to this direction. When you look at the types of things that you've done through your career before you came to the place where you felt good about writing, 
the corporate life, education, all of those different journeys. Do you find that all the parts and pieces of your journey allowed you to be a better writer? I think so. I mean, I think about the experiences that I've endured. And I've had the opportunity to work in corporate America, understand what discipline meant. Mm -hmm. And in writing, you must be disciplined. I, they taught me how to be a producer. And producing a book, producing a play, all of that, because I became a project manager. So mm -hmm. I had to do everything that it took to develop that project. project, yeah. From the beginning to the end, so yes, I think it trained me for writing. There's um, the book that you mentioned, your first. Talk to us about the development of that from coming through corporate America and then you stop and hear this novel is coming out. This is your baby and, and people, everybody knows who knows an author. You really do feel like you are giving birth. This is your project. But talk to us about how you gave birth to that first one. Oh, um, I think I finished graduate school mm -hmm. and I said, I've been telling people for years, I'm gonna write a book. <laughs> so the day I finished graduate school, believe me, I started writing a book. I did exactly as I said I was going to do. Yeah, you spoke it and then it was done. It was, I spoke it and I started doing it. Yeah. But I wasn't a very good writer. <laughs> I can honestly tell you. I was not the writer I am today. Mm. I was a, a green writer. Mm -hmm. So green that people would tell me that, you mm -hmm. know, when I would mm -hmm. submit my, my work to folk. And they say, well, you know, you might want to work on this. And then I did some newspaper writing. I wrote for magazines. I did everything I could to develop my skill. But you know, when you're developing your skill and people are telling you, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this, this isn't good, this is okay. How did you continue to go hearing that? Because that's almost discouraging when they're not saying, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. They're actually telling you what you need to know, but it's not always, it doesn't always feel so good. Well, I've always learned, and I think I learned a long time ago that your friends and family mm -hmm. love you, mm -hmm. and they don't want to hurt you, and they don't want to tell you the truth about you. Mm -hmm. So they will, you know, spare your feelings. But, but the world won't. But, but the world won't. <laughs> so somebody who don't know you, mm -hmm. who comes and says, and who will tell you, you know, you might want to look at this again. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience where I submitted a novel to a lady in, De in Detroit, Michigan at the time. She was the literary agent of Miss Pearl Clegg. And Miss Pearl Clegg yes. introduced us, mm -hmm. actually. And she was so honest, most literary agents would just reject me. Mm -hmm and say absolutely nothing, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. But she called me and she said, you know what? Please don't send me anything like this again. <laughs> oh, wow. She said, you have one chance wow. to make it in this, in this literary world. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna read it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. One chance, and you wanna give us your very best the first time. Mm -hmm. So I knew she knew what she was talking about she had credibility. She right. was referred by Miss Pearl Clegg. Right. So I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went back to work mm -hmm. and I started working on that document. And that became Blackberry Days of Summer. And then from Blackberry Days of Summer to A Right Worthy Woman. Talk to us about this book. I am I was so intrigued just reading about it. And and I can't wait to really dive into the whole novel. This is a story of a woman who actually lived. And you know, we hear so many stories about African American uh, experiences that were never in any history book. This is one that needs to be in a history book. So tell us this story. You know, I have been writing about Maggie Lena Walker since my very first novel. Wow. In Blackberry Days of Summer, I was researching Richmond, Virginia, and I came across this lady, Maggie Walker, and I'm thinking, 
Is this Madam C.J. Walker? When, when I saw that, I thought the same thing, yeah. and it's not. No, it was Maggie Walker, and it said, this lady established and chartered the first African-American bank in America. Well, she's the first woman, period, wow. to charter a bank in America, African or, or otherwise. Uh, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. She was just the... And I said, wait a minute, I'm going to put this woman in my book. So every time I would write something in, in the book about, in Blackberry Road, they escorted Miss Walker into the club, and she sat and at this the, was the Miss... And she sat at the best table. But nobody ever asked me, who was who this is woman that's sitting at the best table in mm -hmm. your novels? Mm. And I happened to... My agent, my current agent, um, decided to send it to Simon... Uh, my Simon thoughts, Schuster. Simon... Sh I had another novel, Simon mm -hmm. Schuster, and I put Maggie Lena Walker in that novel. And the editor says, is this a real person? Because it seems like this girl is she obsessed with Maggie, <laughs> with Maggie Maggie Lena Walker. So she came back. She, she actually denied my book. Mm -hmm. She said, no, we're not going to publish this book. Mm -hmm. But ask her if she would write about Maggie Lena Walker. Wow. Wow. Ask her. So you had planted Maggie in all of these other publications. I had. And wow, that is it's amazing. It's like the universe saw Maggie needing some space. Wow. She is a hidden figure that needed to be discovered. And I kept putting her there, but not in a bold enough manner where anybody paid any attention. How did you bring Maggie through in this book? Because this book is all about her. It is. And she's powerful. She is probably the most indomitable spirit of a woman you will ever meet. She should be in every history book mm -hmm. across the nation, mm -hmm. not just in America, but in the whole African diaspora. Mm. Because she did something in a time period that nobody else has ever done. And because she did it so well, she, people need to know about her. She's a hidden figure that has been slid under the rug. And nobody knows that this African American woman who was born of a slave woman, mm. started the, chartered the first African-American bank, but also the first bank in a, ran by a female in America. So consequently, she's the first woman to be on Wall Street. Period. period. First woman. First woman, period. Because who, there was no other banker. There is only one Walker, female, African-American, that we've ever heard about in, in school and in, in history books. And that's Mag, uh, Madam C.J. Walker. How in the world do we keep missing these gems of stories F for women for African-American women, for marginalized people. Th to me, there's so much to unpack here. It's just, it's like my, it is so much to unpack because it's an important story. And on top of all of the things that she did, it's the time that she did it in. That's so fascinating. Oh. I want to continue this conversation because it is totally fascinating that, as you said, she did this in a time that it shouldn't have been able to be done. Exactly. Stay with us. Stay with us, Ruth, because we've got to hear more about Miss Walker. You guys, this is getting better and better because the story continues. What we need to do is be able to learn about those people that have been marginalized in our history, whether they be black, whether they be poor, whether they be uh, uh, Latina, whatever. Stories like this have to be told, and we're going to continue to tell this one in just a bit. So stay with us. We'll be back in just a bit.